All right, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we, we pray that you would simplify our lives. That we confess that there are so many things uh, that we have jumbling around in our minds. Um, and because of that, we find ourselves chasing so many rabbits. Pursuing things that really don't bring us much life. Wearing ourselves thin. But Father, we know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Yes. Would you help us find that yoke? Would you help us see with clear eyes the things that we need to let go of so that we can have a more firm grasp on you? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, got a couple other folks coming in. Um, <clears throat> Talking about simplicity, and what I want to start talking about, uh, start the conversation with, is just kind of defining simplicity. So here's here's the opening question I want you to think about. How many of you want your life to be more simple? Raise your hand. All right, so if, if you can picture a simple life, what would that look like? What would it look like if your life were more simple than it currently is? Fewer children. Fewer children. <laughs> <laughs> The My favorite thing about that is that, that was, there was no hesitation. Fewer grandchildren. Fewer grandchildren. Okay, well, let's, let's actually unpack this a little bit. Why, why that? What, what comes with this? A lot of responsibility. Yeah. A lot of trauma. Worry. <laughs> Worry. Yeah, I got it. What's that? Like, <laughs> insurance? Is that what that was? Medical bills. Yeah. Bills. Yeah. Bill. Just in general. Right? Really long-term commitments. Long-term commitments. No, it's lifetime commitments. Yeah. It is a lifetime. Well, let's see how they behave. Yeah. Here comes the second one. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on about fewer children. You're number ten. Tell me, keep you too. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's there's a lot going on here, right? Just with this, uh, I I the, just the emotional toll of parenting, right? I mean, it can be exhausting sometimes. Um, okay, what else? If you had a more simple life, what would it look like? Unreasonable clients, fewer of them. Fewer, yeah. So work, right? Um, email that turns off at five o'clock. Nobody can access their email at five o'clock. There are some European countries that do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no illness. <laughs> yeah, we you may know, you know my wife's ankle is messed up right now. And you know, you take that for granted when you can just get around fine. Yeah. But the moment you can't, man, you can get so frustrated. Yep. No life social, gets more complicated. No social media. Social media. Yeah, get rid of social media. Being in education, it makes your life a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Maybe like technology in general doesn't simplify. Uh, yeah. They, well, they are pretty simple, right? What else, what else might life look like if it was more simple? Short, yeah, no traffic. Less stuff. Less stuff, yeah. And how, how does that, how does stuff make our lives more complicated? Clutter. Clutter? Laundry. Maintenance. Laundry. Just a busy yeah, gym. All the work. It seems like all these things, uh, but the thing they have in common is like demands for our attention. Mm, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so that if, if all these things are demanding our attention, right? Like that's how they complicate our lives. Um, what, what might it look like if we got rid of these things? What would that feel like? If, if all this stuff was kind of gone? Like in a Job kind of way? or just in, Not in a Job way, like in a, in a gift kind of way. Like if you just didn't have all this stuff to worry about, what would that feel like? Freedom? Yeah. Maybe boredom. Okay. I think boredom. Less stress. Less stress. Complication isn't that bad. I mean, simplification isn't necessarily a a uh, ticket to heaven or something. I mean, right. You have to work for what you find important and that doesn't work itself is complicated I'm yeah that's right yeah, yeah yeah that's good i there is a level of like what what's the goal here right and it's not necessarily to get rid of all the things we're doing right um because some of them are really really good right there's fulfillment in there's the fulfillment moment. yeah absolutely um and i think that actually helps us define what simplicity actually is and we'll, we'll, we'll meaningful fulfillment yeah, I like that. The Apostle Paul suggested that if we were unencumbered by responsibilities of a family, we could spend more time devoted to serving God. I mean, the fact that the majority of the people in our congregation are married and have families would respectfully disagree with me. Right. But uh, that speaks some truth there. Yeah, yeah. There's an ability to focus. That Paul's talking about there, and focusing on one particular thing. Yeah, good. Uh, why why do we choose to to live like this? What's behind this? Why why are we living like this? Necessity. Necessity. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a level of necessity here. Expectations. Expectation. You want to meet expectations? Yeah. You don't want anyone to think bad of you, and so you're going to keep up with everybody else. If you don't think. Every one of those has a benefit. Yeah, there's good stuff here, right? Oh yeah. None of this is bad. Uh, they can be good. They can be actually really good. Yeah. My uh, my cousin's life was much more complicated trying to have a child than now having one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The, all the worry that went into that. And tons of stuff. The years, twelve years of trying. I think you have evolved uh, me for speed. I mean, you know, the old time it was slow, you know, you did things on a slow pace, but now everything is speed, quick, in a hurry, get her done, and let's go on to the next task. Yeah. If you take away all those things, many of us will just collapse. <laughs> <laughs> you can't walk down the street like you used to do years ago to go from here to there. You need to get there in a hurry, and you need it in a hurry. Yeah, so I think those conveniences as far as evolution is involved. Along with that, if there were none of those things right now, we didn't know. We can bend them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is something in the human spirit that like draws this kind of stuff in. Right? And these things, when you look at it, help us to grow. Yeah. Those uncomfortable things. Uh huh. And I think we'll enjoy help a lot better when we get there. But Christ said, if you suffer, the Bible said, if you suffer with me, we should also reign with me. Yeah. And all of that up there brings about suffering. Yeah. 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 Comfort. Yeah. Yeah. Even before the invention of oh, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Before the invention of the reliable electric light bulb, most people back when you were a kid. <laughs> Shots Before the invention of the reliable electric light bulb, most people went to bed and turned on. Right. Yeah. Right. So the way we dealt with that is we moved the clock back. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, let me read something to you. Um, this comes from a guy named Thomas Kelly. Um, and he's, what I love about this is he's writing in the very early part of the 20th century. Okay. 
Um, and he's feeling too busy and overwhelmed with life, right? And you think about how different things are today than they were in like 1910, right? Um, here's, here's what he says. Let me first suggest that we are giving a false explanation of the complexity of our lives. When we try to explain why we do all these things, we think we know why, but we really don't. It's a false explanation. We blame it on the complex environment. We're living in a really complex environment. Our complex living, we say, is due to the complex world we live in with its radios and autos, which give us more stimulation per square hour than used to be given per square day to our grandmothers. Just multiply that by what fold today. This explanation by the outward order leads us to turn wistfully in some moments to thoughts of a quiet South Island Sea existence or to the horse and buggy days of our great grandparents who went jingle bells, jingle bells over the crisp and ringing snow to spend the day, their day with their grandparents on the farm, right? We, we get caught up, we feel overwhelmed by all these complex things, and we just kind of turn nostalgic, right? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we lived back in the day when everything was just more simple, when there weren't electric light bulbs and we had to have candles and you just went to bed uh, when it got dark. Let me assure you, I have tried the life of the South Seas for a year, the long lingering leisure of a tropic world. And I find that Americans carry into the tropics their same madcap feverish life, which we know on the mainland. Complexity of our program cannot be blamed upon complexity be complexity of our environment, much as we like to think so. What is he saying is our problem? Why are we why do we live so much complex lives? I think it's us. I mean, if you took all that stuff away, we'd still find something to worry about. Because most of it or some of us lived without a lot of those things. We didn't have kids when we were 15 and we thought, man, my world is complex. Yeah. You know? I remember in like third grade. I had like my shoulder started hurting and I had, my mom was like, it's probably because you're so stressed. I'm like, and I told my PE teacher that like, I just, I can't, I can't do anything today. I'm really stressed. <laughs> he like laughed in my face. <laughs> like get out there. We're going to have a dodgeball. <laughs> but yeah, when you're in the moment, it feels like, oh, yeah. we're going to find something to fill that time. Yeah. 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 Monastics write about this like from like 300, 400 AD, and they don't have anything, right? They have like a room. Yeah. They have a bed or some sheets. Like they don't, have, and they have a cross. And they write about like they can't focus, right? Yeah. Like they can't pay attention. There's so many distractions. And in fact, the word sloth, what it meant was just not being willing to stay put. Like, surely there's something better for me to do somewhere else. Than to stay here and pray. Yeah. And even Aristotle, writing like 3,000 years ago, writes about how distracted people are and they bring snacks to the theater. <laughs> I'm really funny. <laughs> um, but you know, he complains about all the distractions people have 3,000 years ago. Yeah. So this is a very old problem. Right, right. <laughs> that, that's internal, right? Right. And they're both, yeah, they're all pointing to it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, all this does is just sort of further solidify the internal stuff, right? Or this is what we latch on to because we're already kind of given to this kind of thing anyway. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I want to talk about a word call, uh, or kind of a concept when it comes to thinking about God, right? When you think about God, what are some of the things that people use to describe? Like all the omnis, right? That's what I'm thinking. Omnipresence. What are the other ones? Yep. Omnipotent, all powerful, omniscient. omniscient. We know all. He knows all things. Eternally, this are like the, the characteristics of God, right? Uh, and we're kind of familiar with a lot of those. But one thing, and I didn't hear about this till like after grad school. But there's a word that some people use to describe God, and it's divine simplicity. What they mean by that is God is not a Lego set, right? Like where you take a bunch of blocks to build something, right? Um, or maybe another way to think about it is like if you're building a canoe, one way to build a canoe is to get a, assemble it from a bunch of different pieces of wood, right? Or you can like carve it out of one single piece of tree trunk, right? 
Simplicity is saying there's one part, one piece to it. And that's how God is. God is not this accumulation of different components. God is one thing. Um, and what God is, is love, right? That's divine simplicity. That's the essence of God. And I think that's instructive for us because I think that's really at the core of what it means to have a simple life, too. Because what happens is we, we have all these different concerns that are floating around in our hearts and minds, and we're constantly chasing them, right? And, and just think about walking into the grocery store and having to make decisions in that space, right? Even just the cereal aisle, and all the, there's an entire aisle full of cereal. And you got to pick out which one you want. And there's all kinds of desires that you have inside of you. It makes it hard to have to make a choice just on that one choice. And we face choices like that a million times a day. And our hearts constantly pulling us different directions, and we end up exhausted and tired and anxious. Because we don't have this grounded sense of who we are and what we want, right? Um, which is why I think, like, when I think about simplicity, that line out of the Beatitudes is really helpful. Blessed are the pure in heart, right? Because what does it mean to be pure? If something is pure, what, what are we describing? Clean. Clean. No flaws? Yeah. Clean. Clean? All one thing. All one thing. Yeah, that's what it is. Because if it has a flaw, what that mean? Like if you have impure water, what does that mean? Well, there's stuff that's not water that's in there, right? There's dirt or something. Um, if you have pure water, that's all, that's all that you have. Uh, so purity is this lack of other stuff, right? This, this ability to say, this is the one thing I want. This is the one thing I want to pursue. And I think that's where simplicity is born. When we have this kind of laser focus on this, this is the kind of life I want to live. Because that becomes a filter for looking at all the stuff we're doing, right? That we have to say yes to some things. And there's things we should say yes to, right? But if we say yes to everything, what happens? Chaos. We're swamped. Chaos. We're swamped. We're overwhelmed. We have to be able to say no as well. And, and the key to having a more simple life is the ability to say no. Um, and what that takes is some discernment, right? Yeah. You have to figure out what, what you should say no to. Um, and that's actually kind of a complicated process uh, because there is a lot of good stuff to say yes to. Um, but until we learn to say no, we, gosh, we're going to be constantly overwhelmed. Um, Okay, y'all know the shaker, that old shaker song? We always played this in band. The, tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. Y'all know this? Yeah. Keep going. No. <laughs> 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 Keep going <out> <laughs> <laughs> I was about to go viral. <laughs> uh, okay, here's, here's the lyrics. It's old, old Quaker hymn. And if you think about Quakers, it's Amish, right? Like, picture Amish folks. Very, very simple. In fact, their worship services, their minds would be blown if they came to our worship service. Mm -hmm. Because their worship services are literally, it's like 20 people max. And they're just in a circle, and they sit in silence, waiting for someone to have a word, like receive a word from God to share with the rest of the group. But most of the time, it's just quiet. They're just sitting there. And then someone will say something, and then 20 minutes will pass. And someone will respond. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's what their worship service is. Very, very simple. Very pared down. Um, and so those are the folks that wrote this song. Or it's, I don't know if they wrote this, but it's it's kind of attributed to that lifestyle. It says, a gift to be simple. It says, a gift to be free. It's a gift to come down where we ought to be. When we find ourselves in a place just right, it will be in the valley of love and delight. <clears throat> when true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight. Till by turning, turning we come round right. Okay, so I want to think about that first half of that uh, and unpack that just a little bit. It is a gift to be simple. It is a gift to be free. It is a gift to come down where we ought to be. 
And when we find ourselves in a place just right, it will be the valley of love and delight. What, ha- what it's saying is what happens when we find that place where we ought to be, which can be anywhere, actually, right? What makes something the place we ought to be is not that like all the circumstances are right. It's that our heart is at peace. And if we can find that place, that place of contentment, what happens all around us is love and delight, right? It's this the, the kind of life you want to live. And then it goes on, um, and this is where I think it's talking about what it means to say no, right? When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, that is repent, to change, we're not ashamed. So we're not going to be ashamed by our turning, by our changing our minds, because turning will be our delight, by turning will come round, right, right? It's this ability to change our minds and say no to things we ought to say no to, and say yes to what we ought to say yes to. That's that's where simplicity is found. Um, okay, well, that by the blank stairs, I don't know if that hit you the same way it hit me. But I, <laughs> so, you were hoping you were going to yeah. I really think the valid bend is humility. Right? Yeah, I, I think that that's yeah. that's there too. Yeah, yeah and acceptance. Yeah, yeah, because it takes humility to change, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, yeah. Um, you said, you know, it's about learning to say no, but I think before that, it's learning to say yes to the things that put you in the love of God. Mm, yeah. Um, put you in fellowship with Trinity. And then, and then you'll know what to say no to. Yeah. And say yes to what's the environment that makes it possible for me to, to pursue that. To live that way. Right. Right. And so that means you're going to say yes to a lot of Right. But there will also be, you'll know then what to say. Right. Yeah. Because uh, I think about just our families, uh-huh. right? Um, there's a way There's a way in which this simplifies life, right? It can feel very hectic. But if we've given our whole selves, our yes to living in love with our family, um, that clarifies a lot. Uh, I think about marriage, too, right? To say yes to your spouse means you're saying no to a whole lot of other stuff, right? To a lot of other people. And that simplifies your romantic life, doesn't it? Kind of, most of the time. It complicates it in new ways. Look at that. You're in a little lighter. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If Kristen's not in here, no one's all in here. But, but you're, that, I think Dorothy's exactly right. That yes helps us filter what we should na- say no to. But if we have that first yes, I think that's good. Um, man, that's helpful. Uh, to mm-hmm. live a more simple life, to know, man, we, I can let go of all this other stuff. Um, okay, so I want to transition just a little bit. Um, I'm going to pass out uh, these sheets. Uh, this comes from a book called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Sure some of you are familiar with it. Um, but he's got 10 uh, kind of pieces of advice for living a more simple life. Um, I want us to read together and kind of process together. He also, as you're passing that around, he also wrote this book called Freedom of Simplicity. Uh, which is such a profound and helpful book. Every time I read it, um, and it's one of those that I'll return to uh, several times, um, I'm just convicted all over again by the stuff we're talking about. Uh, Okay, so let's kind of read through these. And what I want you to be thinking about is, number one, which of these 10 things would you find the hardest to practice? Uh, And which of these 10 would you find the easiest? So, like, you can start this tomorrow. Or maybe you're already doing it. Um, all right, number one. To begin on the path of simplicity or to practice simplicity, what you got to do, number one, buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. Cars should be bought for their utility, not their prestige. Consider your clothes. Most people have no need for more clothes. They buy more, buy more not because they need clothes, but because they want to keep up with the fashions, paying the fashions. Uh, well, Shane Claiborne has this like 50, 50 ways to love your neighbor and one of the things he talks about is covering up any uh, logos on your clothing 
right? Because why, so often we buy the logo more than the clothing itself because of what we think it says about us. Number two, reject anything that is producing an addiction in you. Learn to distinguish between a real psychological need like cheerful surroundings and an addiction. Any of the media that you find you cannot do without, get rid of. If money has a grip on your heart, give some away and feel the inner release. Number three, develop a habit of giving things away. If you find that you're becoming attached to some possession, consider giving it to someone who needs it. De-accumulate. Masses of things that are not needed complicate life. They must be sorted and stored and dusted and resorted and restored ad nauseum. Number four, refuse to be propagandized by the custodians of modern gadgetry. Most gadgets are built to break down and wear out. And so complicate our lives rather than enhance them. Usually gadgets are an unnecessary drain on the energy resources of the world. Environmental responsibility alone should keep us from buying the majority of the gadgets produced today. I remember buying an iPhone one time and the person said to me as I like as I was checking out, congratulations. And I thought that's the weirdest thing to say <laughs> at a checkout. Like, what what have I accomplished here? Um, but I, but I think there, there's a whole narrative that makes sense of that, right? Oh, you are now a part of the Illuminati or something, right? Because you have an iPhone. Um, number five, learn to enjoy things without owning them. Owning things is an obsession in our culture. If we own it, we feel we can control it. If we control it, we feel it will give us more pleasure. That idea is an illusion. Enjoy the beach without feeling you have to buy a piece of it. Uh, my dad's a librarian. Uh, and so it drove him crazy every time I went to Barnes & Noble and bought books, right? Because he's like, you realize there's a whole place where you go and get this stuff for free, right? Um, but I like having the books in my, in my office. It makes me feel smart. Number six, develop a deeper appreciation for creation. Get close to the earth. Walk whenever you can. Listen to the birds. Enjoy the texture of grass and leaves, smell the flowers, marvel in the rich colors everywhere. Number seven, look with a healthy skepticism at all buy now, pay later, later schemes. They're a trap and only deepen your bondage. Certainly prudence as well as simplicity, simplicity demands that we use extreme caution before incurring debt. Number eight, obey Jesus' instructions about plain, honest speech. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from people. If you consent to do a task, do it. Avoid flattery and half-truths. Make honesty and integrity the distinguishing characteristics of your speech. That's one thing uh, we haven't really talked about yet, but simplicity of speech uh, is important as well. Uh, reject anything, number nine, reject anything that breeds the oppression of others. Do we sip our coffee and eat our bananas at the expense of exploiting Latin American peasants? In the world of limited resources, does our lust for wealth mean the poverty of others? Should we buy products that are made by forcing people into dull assembly line jobs? Do we enjoy hierarchical relationships in the company or factory that keeps others under us? Do we oppress other, our children or spouse because we feel certain tasks are beneath us? That's one of my favorite questions that I saw. I think it's Rich Melotis, who's a pastor up in New York, said, uh, uh, as a minister, the one question you should ask yourself to check how prideful you are, how humble you are, is what tasks in the church do you think are underneath you? Right? He asked himself that question all the time. What are you not willing to do because you think that will be? That's, that's, that's not my job. Um, I think it's a question, good question for anybody to ask. Number 10, shun anything that distracts you from seeking first the kingdom of God. It's so easy to lose focus in the pursuit of legitimate, even good things, good things. Job, position, status, family, friends, security, these and many more will all uh, can all too quickly become the center of attention. Okay, so those are the 10. Which of those would you find? Uh, let's start with the easiest. Which one you'd be like, okay, I can do this. I'm already doing it. Uh, or I can start tomorrow and not be a big deal. Number eight. Yeah, on a speech. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the one that came to mind for me too. That, that, yeah, that's literally it's a breeze. Um, yeah, Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the first great American philosophers, said the greatest influence in the mind of a scholar is love for nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Number three. Number three. Yeah. If you're a servant, you're already given what's allotted to you by Yahweh anyway. Your time, gifts, it's not just material. Yeah. It's the spiritual things that you're giving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, giving of ourselves is included in that, right? Because we can be we can be greedy and hoard our time and energy too. Uh, and so it's a love, it's a gift. Yeah. To give give that to someone. Yeah, that's good. One and seven. One and seven the easiest? Yeah, that's easy. Five things for the usefulness, right? Yeah. And then seven, healthy. Yeah. yeah. Four. Number four? Yeah. yeah. Good do, you have, do you have an iPhone? I do. Okay. More than one. More than one. <laughs> like that. This does sound easy for you, James. <laughs> <laughs> talk about it. I got it all. <laughs> is that the way? Is this the easiest or hardest for you? That's the hardest. Okay. 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 Gotcha. <laughs> so which one covers um, care for one? We yeah. don't want to bank around on each other. Yeah. But care for one another. You know, you reach out to people, whether by text or by phone or in person, and on a regular basis. And sometimes, you know, we're so busy, we just don't have the time. So I was trying to figure out which one of these fall into that category. Yeah. Yeah. But see, that's that's a hard thing because we just don't have the time. And that's I right. Have iPhone. Yeah. I have an iPhone 6. And I, and thank you. Yep. <laughs> you remember that number? Don't don't, don't get it. <laughs> I remember when I got it, and the guy said, "You talking congratulations?" When, when I got the phone, he said, "You are now out of date." He said in those words, particular, but he said, "You know the iPhone Seven is coming out." In <laughs> <laughs> He's already trying to sell you the next one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Number ten. Number ten. Yeah. Number ten. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, part of what I think this does for us is when, when we're able to simplify, what I have found, when I have more margins in my life, I'm a better person, right? Uh, if I am late or about to be late somewhere, that's when I'm going to have road rage, right? Uh, but if I have plenty of time, I'm great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, unless they're cutting. Unless they're cutting. <laughs> Some of us struggle with road rage more than others. <laughs> that's yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, or, or having those having those places where you, you're you are actually thinking of other people, and you send that text, or you make the phone call, or you go over to the house, or you drop off it, whatever it is. That requires some margin in our lives because if we're not careful, we're just completely consumed with all all the balls we're juggling in the air, right? And we don't have time to to think about anyone else. What else? What what else is hardest on here for you? Let's transition to that. Well, all about hardest, but I think some of these things are oversimplification. Mm. Like this number nine, do we sip our coffee and eat our bananas at the expense of exploiting? Latin American peasants. Yeah. Okay, so if we, we rejected coffee and bananas, are they gonna grow poppy so they can produce heroin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we live we live in a really complex world and some of the ways we try to help actually end up hurting. Exactly. Right? So there's a level of discernment for sure. Hey, I think it's talking about fair wages. I think it has to be a fair wage to take advantage of people who are in a bad spot. Yeah. And then corporations take advantage of people. Right. Thinking more about like fair trade. Fair kind of trade. Stuff. Yeah. Your your iPhone again is you know made by eight year old children who work twenty hours a day. Right. And nobody wants to you know phone after that. Right. And that's why because it's so easy. Or it's, yeah. yeah. But otherwise, it'd be a ten thousand dollar phone. Right. And yeah. so we were ready, we're ready to give that off for for the savings. Yep. Yeah. I was just gonna say that is hard too because it requires consciousness. Like that's right. To know like. You know, it, it takes a little bit of effort to know where your stuff is coming from. So that's the other thing is a lot of the time I think about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because we, and because we're so stressed and we got all this other stuff we're thinking about, but the last thing we want to do is like do all this research about like which corporations are trustworthy and which ones, you know, try to do all that thinking. Um, it's so much easier just to grab and go, right? There's an app for that. There is an app for that? What's the app? BIPOP. By? How do you spell it? I think like B U Y C O T T. I mean, I don't use it, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people do. <laughs> my, my mother does. Is that my my cop? Like, like yeah. okay. my, my mom uses that and tells us like we're not buying craft. We are buying Annie's. We're not buying. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. 
But what we need to also understand um, is that we have a different standard of living than a lot of people in these countries. And I'm not saying that, you know, but about us, you know, feeling bad because we're wearing clothing that's being made in, uh, you know, Honduras or Guatemala and, very, and India. But if these people did not have these jobs, then they would be much better, they would be much worse off than they already are. I'm not saying that, I think, like you said, that, you know, companies need to treat their employees better and maybe higher wages, but it also gives them a standard of living mm -hmm. that they would not have if they were not working in those industries. Because yeah. um, I used to teach fashion design and, and fashion. We talk about that a lot about those, um, you know, the well, so we had well, so, and this is this is why I love. There's a uh, mission Lazarus. Sorry, this one. Um, I I learned about them uh, through uh, my time in Midland. Um, it's a mission effort, uh, and the work they're doing is to try to leverage this. Like they train folks, right, to make leather goods or jewelry or there's a whole and coffee too like to have a coffee plantation and the whole thing is let's let's design this system in a way that actually takes care of the folks who are who are doing this work um in, in a humane way uh, and i've i've loved watching because i think that's a picture of what that can look like um if we actually cared about people right um and I, and I hope there's more stories out there like this that, that we're that we're aware of. Um, but yeah, it takes it takes some willingness on our part to to do that research uh, and to figure out where where are the things we actually should should support. Um, and that man, gosh, it takes a lot of work and discernment. Yeah, I think that almost every action and reaction in this country is criticized, and so. All of those reactions usually are negative. It doesn't make any difference. Who's in control of what? Power that can move. Yeah. But the only thing you can really control is what you sell, what you have in yourself, what you can control, what's yeah. in your control. Yeah. And so rather than getting involved in the ramifications of whatever you know of everything that's going on. Need, I think you need to personally concentrate on what you can control, mm -hmm. not what the politics of the day is, or what you are, but the things that you can physically control. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, again, there, yeah, that is simplicity. Um, because uh, it's easy to take on all these burdens, right, and feel like, well, I've got to save the world. Um, but all of us are in positions where we're making decisions that affect other people, right? And I think it's so wise to start there and say, okay, how, how can I live in a way that actually is a, a blessing? And what do, what do I need to say no to in order to make that happen? Like, what's my deeper yes that I'm trying to get to? Uh, how, do, how do I want to love other people? Um, and, and to do kind of interrogate our lives so that we can simplify to that point where we're just living out of that, that place. All right. Any other final thoughts? My favorite scripture. Okay. <laughs> in First Thessalonians four eleven, um, but I encourage you, brothers, to do even more to seek to lead a quiet life, a quiet yeah. life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands as we commanded you, so you may walk properly in the presence of outsiders and not be dependent on anyone. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Love that. Yeah. Let's close with that then. It's <laughs> a good final word. Uh, all right, let's go worship together. Blessings.